All right, let's, uh, let's give it a shot. All right, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure today to have you here with us, remotely, physically. Uh, it's great to see all the beautiful faces we've been missing for a long time. Um, Bilal and I put together, hopefully, a nice uh, panel today about uh, heterogeneity in hardware, opportunities and challenges for software and application. All right, so I'd like to start with uh, the ten, top 10 supercomputers. Uh, this is the list that has been revealed just uh, yesterday. Fugaku, number one, round of applause for uh, you know, Japan. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really nice, uh, you know, uh, system that we've seen uh, taking uh, number one for the full benchmark in HPC. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are other also entries in this uh, top 10 that I won't go uh, into detail, but, um, you know, the uh, take home message is to look at what are the systems that are homogeneous in terms of uh, architecture design. Um, so there are two of those uh, systems in the top 10 that, that have that characteristic. If you look at the heterogeneity, uh, you have a huge number here of supercomputers that uh, occupy you know, the, the, the top 10, the eight others, right? Um, so uh, it's not about hardware, right? It's really about application, as uh, we like to say. Give me application performance. This is what we care about, right? And for that, we look at uh, Gordon Bell finalists this year. There uh, are lots of uh, really cool large-scale applications. And um, you know, the take-home message here is that those applications run also on homogeneous, but also heterogeneous architecture, right? And uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, one of the applications that I'd like actually to uh, uh, highlight a little bit is molecular dynamics, where the author uh, put together uh, a customized uh, you know, supercomputer to perform those MD calculation uh, in, in, a, in a high throughput, right? And, uh, you know, this is really a call for co-design, perhaps, right? We've been talking about this uh, for, for, for many years. Uh, this happens at, uh, you know, small scale, uh, and we yet have to see uh, this uh, becoming uh, mainstream. And uh, this is a, a slide by uh, John Schalf uh, that I uh, stole from him, uh, you know, showing architecture specialization for science, where he advocates for uh, the necessity of putting together, you know, uh, heterogeneous uh, architecture to solve some of the largest, uh, you know, important, uh, uh, you know, scientific application. All right. So, but this has also, uh, this needs to be done uh, in close collaboration with applied math, with people who design algorithm, who design uh, algorithm that would uh, uh, extract performance from the underlying hardware architecture. All right, so with this, I'll, I'll let you with that slide. Here, let me introduce briefly our uh, six uh, panelists. Uh, Robert uh, Wisniewski from Intel, Laura Gregory from INRIA, Satoshi Matsuoka from Tokyo Institute of Technology, RICAN, uh, James Lin uh, from uh, Schengen uh, Supercomputing Center, Peter Lucek from ICL University of Tennessee, uh, and Anima uh, Anand Kumar uh, from Caltech NVIDIA, and I believe she just joined us, right? Not yet? Yes. Oh. There you go. All right. So Anima is with us. Awesome. Okay. All right. So with that, I'll so first uh, I'll let the uh, panelists introduce themselves for uh, five to six to seven to eight minutes, rather short introduction, so that we have enough time to interact with the audience online and, and, and available on site. Um, so our first speaker uh, to introduce herself is Anima. Anima, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, yep. everyone. Hey, Anima. Great to see you. Yeah, great to see everyone. And uh, yeah, great to see this uh, be in the hybrid mode uh, this time. Uh, hopefully, everything's going smoothly there. Uh, uh, you know, in fact, I will be there on Thursday for my plenary. Apologize, I couldn't be there for this session. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to this panel. I think uh, it's such a, a diverse um, set of uh, experts here. and. Uh, Today, I'll give you a brief overview of uh, some of the recent announcements uh, we just made at NVIDIA with respect to right, the topic here in terms of how do we deal with heterogeneity in hardware and how do we deal with a diversity of applications uh, that need to be supported. So let me start by sharing the slides. Hope everyone can see this. 
Yeah, so, you know, indeed at NVIDIA, we're very excited about uh, building a full stack solution now uh, for a wide range of applications, right? So indeed we start with GPUs, but it is much more than that. So the role of software, which is the topic of this panel is really important to support this diversity of applications from the edge all the way to the cloud and supercomputing. And how do we build uh, you know, pre-trained models or give uh, people a ease to get started on AI applications, uh, right? And deal with limited data, uh, robustness requirements and other challenges is something uh, we work on uh, continuously here at NVIDIA. And indeed, you know, at supercomputing this, you would have heard a lot is the convergence of HPC and AI, right? And especially for so many scientific applications, we need this to get a million fold speed up in simulation performance. You know, my talk on Thursday will also focus on AI for science, how AI is powering uh, some of the most challenging simulations today uh, and in fact two of the Gordon Bell finalists uh, that I was part of also used AI methods in combination with uh, traditional uh, HPC pipelines and this kind of hybrid computing uh, is the way to go uh, to get all the way to a million x speed up you know that wouldn't be just the accelerated computing or the scale up and out but you'll need machine learning on top. And so indeed the challenges are also immense in terms of uh, you know, how we can say build um, the digital twin of the uh, earth for climate. You know, that was a recent announcement uh, that uh, uh, Jensen made uh, in terms of uh, building the next uh, most powerful supercomputer for climate research. And so this is an exciting time uh, to be in this area. And indeed, as I mentioned, uh, there is the heterogeneity of uh, hardware requirements comes especially on the edge, right? So you uh, have a wide range of applications with uh, different processing uh, requirements, bandwidth constraints, battery constraints, and that I think uh, makes it a lot more challenging than building something homogenous, uh, you know, in a supercomputer for one application. And so a recent announcement that Jensen made at GTC last week was to ask how to handle this diversity of applications, right? Because on one side you have uh, the traditional supercomputing uh, applications. It's usually one application, you know, it requires uh, very high efficiency and we build for that. On the other side are cloud applications, right? You require secure multi-tenancy. Uh, but this is usually not optimized for, for performance because uh, it's challenging to handle so many uh, different applications. And so what we announced uh, last week at GTC was this new paradigm of cloud native supercomputing, where you can get the performance of bare metal, but with the support for secure multi-tenancy and cloud-like applications. And I think this will then bring the two worlds together and allow us not just to scale out on one application, but also support a diversity of users. And the idea is, you know, why this is challenging is, uh, you know, for one application, right, you can kind of focus all the optimizations towards uh, ensuring the execution time uh, is optimized, but with multi-tenancy, right, it's much more diffuse. You have uh, so many applications vying for the same resources and uh, how to have efficiency is, uh, is hard to do. And also these applications can change over time. So you can't just design for one setting. And that's where the NVIDIA Quantum 2, which is the InfiniBand uh, that was uh, recently announced, uh, is for the first time uh, able to handle these challenges. You know, it's able to have bare metal uh, performance, but also support multi-tenant secure uh, applications and have performance isolation, uh, telemetry-based congestion control so that one application doesn't overwhelm right, the traffic. Uh, and also 
uh, 32 times faster in network computing. Uh, so that can support very large scale AI training and other loads. And lastly, nanosecond level precision timing that can handle a range of different uh, distributed applications uh, and allow for, right, uh, the handoff and other overhead to be minimized so we can avoid race conditions and also support ultimately, uh, you know, 5G enabled um, uh, telecommunications networks so the cloud data centers can interact uh, also with telecommunication uh, because of this precision timing. And so I think this is something that we're very excited about. Uh, you may be aware of the Celine um, DGX SuperPod uh, that we built at NVIDIA. You know, many of the exciting um, announcements we made, such as uh, the uh, largest uh, quantum simulation for solving MaxCut was done on Celine. But if it were to be built today with Quantum 2, it would have a bandwidth that would be roughly one and a half times the total internet traffic on this planet. So that shows the power of uh, this technology and what it can deliver because networking is critical for having a cloud native uh, supercomputer. And that's uh, something I wanted to emphasize here. And so with that, we can now you know, get uh, performance isolation and guaranteed performance even with uh, multi-tenancy. So since this panel is about the hardware software uh, co-design, uh, I also wanted to talk about some of our uh, latest research in this area, right? So, you know, we've uh, talked about how, you know, there is uh, a need to reduce energy efficiency, right? So we are aware that especially large language models and other AI models are not great for the planet. Like we can't continue to uh, train them on large scale and uh, you know, we have to worry about sustainable AI research. And one aspect is you know, how do we design good quantization schemes that uh, do not lead to accuracy loss but can be much more efficient uh, in energy consumption. And so we took a bold step and said, instead of you know, reducing FP32 to lower precision, let's come up with an alternative quantization scheme that just gets rid of the mantisa, right? So you just do it in the logarithmic system with just the exponent. I mean, this may seem very harsh quantization because we are only right, having uh, an exponentially growing quantization gap uh, with magnitude. And is this good enough to encode AI models? Uh, but it turns out that our brains and many biological brains store in the logarithmic system. So that was in fact the starting inspiration for us to consider this. Uh, but what we were able to show is we can, you know, do a different optimization scheme based on multiplicative updates and reduce energy consumption by as much as 90% using the scheme and, uh, you know, doing it all the computations mostly in the logarithmic system and uh, having approximations for addition uh, that allows us to get this energy reduction. So I think something like this could be very useful for energy constrained edge devices, right? Uh, so we can do with a very few number of bits and directly train on it. We don't need to train on the cloud. We don't need to train on full precision, uh, which is very exciting. Anima, Another, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. You have yeah. one more minute because we need yes. to give time yes, to all panelists. This, and yeah, thank you. Yes, this is my last slide. So another exciting announcement that I'll go into more depth uh, on Thursday is uh, on designing multi-basis encoding schemes for quantum optimization, right? So in this case, the hardware efficiency we want is on quantum systems. And so the question is like classical optimization problems like max cut, how do we encode that efficiently into quantum circuits? And so instead of just encoding it to one quantum spin, right? So we can encode it into multiple quantum spins and lead to an exponential reduction in the simulation complexity and still get high accuracy of recovering the max cut. And so in fact, this roughly 3000 node uh, graph that uh, we uh, simulated on Celine uh, at NVIDIA 
uh, is the record in terms of the largest graph uh, that is simulated well, for a quantum simulation. And uh, so this also, I think, opens up a lot of exciting uh, new ground on how, you know, the developments we've done for AI, how that would also help in simulating quantum systems efficiently and vice versa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anima. All right, our next uh, panelist, uh, it's uh, Bob Wisniewski. Alrighty, can, first of all, can you hear me okay? And can you see the slide? Hello? All good. Perfect. Oh, okay, all right, very good. Um, all right, great. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on this panel. I'm actually really excited to be here this morning or this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are uh, viewing from. And um, I've been thinking about heterogeneity uh, for a couple of years now, both from a hardware and a software uh, perspective, as, as the title indicates. So that's what we'll spend the next uh, five to six minutes talking about. Um, let, let's start off, though. Why, why are we going down heterogeneity um, from an architecture point of view? Yes, there's certainly a lot of top machines. I love the, the, you know, the, the, the graphic, the eight of the top 10. And yeah, I, I think it's something you know, about that ratio across the top 500 that are, that are using simulator. Uh, I'm sorry, that are using heterogeneity. Um, but what, you know, why, why are we moving in this direction? Um, the first is, I think, is that the, uh, the breadth of HPC is really increasing. Right. I think we'd still be doing it if it wasn't for that. Um, but the fact that when when I think about HPC now, it's not just modeling and simulation. When I say HPC, I really mean it's modeling, simulation, AI, and machine learning, deep learning, as well as big data analytics. And that's really the way that we're approaching it. Um, you know, at Intel, that that HPC really is this collection of everything. So, from a header, when you when you think about having to cover the breadth of this. Um, the best way to achieve the performance per cost and, and the performance per power that we need is by moving to heterogeneous processors, not, not just the GPUs, but um, vector computing, spatial computing, as well as matrix computing. All of these, we believe, are going to be important going forward. I, I think there's, a, there's an interesting an analogy to maybe the transition we went through almost to, you know, a little short of two decades ago, and that is, I remember I was sitting at a, um, or presenting at a, I guess it, well, it wasn't Hyperion at that point, it was IDC, but it was a user forum. And I was talking about at that point, uh, you know, the next blue gene and how we were going to actually have four, you know, four-way threading. And, and I remember the comment was, no, please don't do that, just give us more frequency. And um, so I think, you know, we would all be delighted, right, if we could somehow just continue on scalar computing and just crank up the frequency. But the, the reality of the situation where technology is driving us is in order to continue to achieve the super exponential uh, performance that we've enjoyed in HPC, whether it's per cost or per power, we need to take into account heterogeneity. So, you know, that's something I wanted to ground us in because sometimes, you know, we would think otherwise. So. All right, so given that, what would be the ideal solution, right? And, and what I'm gonna argue is that, um, yes, this is a panel about software, but we need to have, and, and I, I love, you know, the, the previous uh, discussion on co-design, because uh, fully aligned with that, in that we need to approach this from a software and a hardware point of view. So from a software point of view, if you could just, you know, wave a magic wand, how are we gonna deal with heterogeneity? Ideally, you'd love to see just a single programming development, right? You, you write your code, it doesn't matter whether it's going to run on a CPU, a GPU, uh, an AI engine, uh, FPGA, or, or whatever, right? You would have a, a single development environment, you'd write it once, and then it would run everywhere. Now, maybe you'd have to do, of course, you'd have to do some optimizations depending on where it ran. But from a hardware point of view, what would you like, right? You'd like the ability for a given customer, for a given, maybe for even for a given workload, but certainly for a given customer or a given uh, supercomputer that you're putting together, the ability to mix and match these different types of things, easily put them together and either have them be very tightly coupled and, and deliver great performance or have them be loosely coupled. But regardless, you want this ability to mix and match. So where are we going? From a software point of view, hopefully everybody is familiar with one API. I'll spend a few uh, minutes uh, talking, I mean, not, 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 I won't spend a few minutes, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about it here. But, but this is um, Intel's software approach. It's, it's not an Intel proprietary solution. It's something that we are working very broadly across the uh, industry as well as ecosystem, partners, um, you know, supercomputer centers, uh, customers, et cetera. 
Um, the notion is that there will be a, a single um, way that you can program this. Um, lots of different languages, I'm sorry, not a single way, but there's lots of different languages, but once you write your program, it will run on top of, again, CPUs, GPUs, AI engines, FPGAs, spatial engines, um, et cetera. You have the same development environment, you have the same debugging capabilities. If you want to performance tune, you have the same performance tools. And then all of the libraries, whether they're AI, the standard HPC, um, big data uh, libraries are all being optimized on top of this. And then finally, from a hardware perspective, you know, what, what are our thoughts? And this is a bit more of a forward looking statement. Um, first of all, we want the ability to very tightly couple uh, the different types of the compute, whether it's, it's scalar, vector, spatial, and matrix. And at some point, um, you know, and CXL is, is driving a bit in this direction, right? But at some point, we want to move towards more of a pure model, right? Um, we want to be able to significantly reduce the overheads of launching kernels on some of the, you know, the, the accelerator. And, and the reason you want to do that is once you have a very low cost way of leveraging the accelerator, it reduces. The, um, and if you have a symmetric and shared memory, which is the next bullet down, it reduces the uh, programmer, uh, the developer expertise and burden of being able to leverage the accelerator. So this, this is very critical. And then finally, when you have this tight coupled environment, you have a very high bandwidth and, and low latency coherence interface that allows uh, the, um, the different types of compute to be all very tightly coupled. So, so finally, in conclusion, um, I, you know, I think we've all, the reason we're all here is because we believe in the importance of heterogeneity. Um, it will be the key to continue to unlock this super exponential growth, whether it's, you know, whether your metric is performance per dollar or whether it's performance per power. Um, there's many different aspects of heterogeneity, of course. But today, we're really just sort of focusing in on, on the compute and the software to take advantage of the compute. But, you know, recognize the fact that the memory stack is getting deeper. There's lots of new I.O. And, and software, obviously, is key to being able to leverage this. And, and, and as part of that, and again, just hearkening back, we are designing both hardware and software together. We really need to view this problem holistically. Um, and co-design hardware and software. So um, with that, I'll, I'll stop here and we'll look forward to questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right, our next uh, panelist is Laura. She's an expert in uh, avoiding communication, but today we make an exception. You need to <laughs> make some communication for us. Thank you, thank you, Atem and Bilal. I'm, I'm glad to, to be here. I'm sorry not to be in person with you. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll bring a perspective uh, from an algorithmic point of view. And so I'm looking at this heterogeneity as an opportunity for uh, algorithmic uh, innovation. And uh, yeah, it was said before, right, that we have this increasing heterogeneity to unprecedented levels. At the same time, we, we, don't, we cannot forget that we have another problem, the fact that the communication cost is uh, in, is the gap between the communication cost and the cost of performing arithmetics is increasing. Uh, in particular, now is this uh, low precision arithmetics which goes so fast. So we have to take this into account as well. Then, when we look at the heterogeneity, we have heterogeneity in terms of compute units, in terms of memory, and now in terms of uh, precision of floating point arithmetic, right? Because <coughs> In particular, in scientific computing, we are used to have our computation in double or in single, but since 2008, we have half precision, and then we had deep float, and then we've just seen also 8 bits computation, right? And if before you're expecting, you expecting to go from double to single and get a factor of two, now you get a more important factor, so it's becoming, uh, of course, necessary to, to use this low precision arithmetics. Uh, if we look at the applications, those are getting more and more complex. Uh, and so from a linear algebra point of view, uh, we have to deal with uh, current algorithms and methods, which sometimes have a hard time to converge. And uh, clearly, they have scalability problems. And uh, those come from, uh, from the need sometimes to synchronize all those thousands, millions of processors to compute a dot product. 
And so some, some venues to explore, again, from algorithmic software point of view, when we have to address all these issues. Um, one, uh, one option, of course, coming from me is uh, looking at algorithms which will minimize uh, communication, knowing that you get a reduction in time and in energy. And I have to say that for most of the time, we consider simple models and heterogeneity is not really taken into account so far. So we really have to address this. Another, another venue clearly that we need to explore is randomization. Uh, and I will be focusing a bit more on this. And then of course, uh, we, we have to use multiple precision, but we have to be able to control the loss of accuracy. And so let me just show you a, a brief highlight on, on randomization and how this could be used in, in linear solvers, knowing that it all, not only reduces communication and arithmetic complexity, but it also allows to exploit uh, mixed precision arithmetic. So that's really a powerful technique, which relies uh, on sketching. So if you have to deal with a high dimensional subspace, then through these techniques, you can embed it in a low dimensional one while preserving some geometry. And of course, it's hugely used for computing low rank approximations, for compressing data. And recently we looked at how can we use this for uh, accelerating linear solvers, because after all, when you have a numerical simulations, you at some point you have to solve a linear system or an eigenvalue problem. So it still remains one of the main problems we look at in, uh, in high performance computing. And so just, just briefly to show you, to give you an idea on how this would work for orthogonalizing a set of vectors. So basically you are giving uh, some, some vectors, but of very, very large size. And then you just want to orthogonalize them. So what you do is that you go one by one from, uh, through these vectors. And then when you are given a new vector, you orthogonalize them against the previous one. So mainly you have to find this projector that allows you to orthogonalize it. And the randomization here is really working very well because basically what we know is that when we have to orthogonalize these high dimensional vectors, we can sketch them, so obtain some vectors of much smaller dimension. And then we go through uh, solving this small dimension problem in a more accurate way and use this small problem to get an orthogonalization process for the entire high dimensional vectors. And so uh, why, why this is really working nice in mixed precision is because once you, you can work in a lower precision, and, but then once you get a small problem, then you can increase your precision because now you're working on something very small, which should go very fast. So it's really something that is working well for mixed precision algorithms. And then overall, when we do such a randomization process, it's, it's very nicely getting a procedure which uh, becomes uh, more, even more stable than the deterministic procedures for orthogonalization, uh, faster with less communication and really tailored to, to mixed precision algorithms. So uh, fr from my point of view, heterogeneity, it's really giving us uh, nice research directions and opportunities to develop novel algorithms and novel software. That's from my side. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. Our next panelist is Satoshi. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Okay, I'm going to be a little controversial here and uh, show my, you know, to spice. And also, it's a little bit of preview of my invited talk. So uh, I'll get more detailed description. I don't have six minutes, so get the very essential content. So, uh, my, so my claim is, you know, homogeneity is a key to the success of heterogeneity. Okay, and uh, and also this kind of spells why uh, Kugaku is, you know, thankfully very very successful in not just rankings, but my Gordon Bell finalists and and all that, and many many other applications. And and I will also claim that actually all the other machines on the top 10 that you can claim, which is in some sense heterogeneous, but also very, very much homogeneous. They're all homogeneous. Okay. So uh, there are various ways to achieve uh, domain specific acceleration. You can have on chip integration, you can have multi, you know, put, it, put stuff in the core, you can do multiple packaging, you can on node accelerators like GPUs and so forth. 
or you can build you know, separate machines and then tie them up together with, uh, you know, with the fast network. And there are various ways, but irrespective of what you do, you have to remember the accelerations or you know, achieved by some sort of heterogeneity other than standard CPUs are means to net. Okay. So it's not it's not a purpose by itself. So you try to achieve, you know, what you can do better with standard, you know, with this, what the standard CPU can do in a phone line instance. So uh, so even Fugaku, you can you know, on one hand, um, you know, it's very homogeneous. You've got 160,000 nodes of CPU, but also, but inside the chip, it's, there, there are heterogeneous components. So on one hand, it's like an ARM pro, you know, it's a 48 core ARM processor but it's built like, also built as a streaming processor. It's not that it has CPU inside, but the cores have very wide vectors, there are memory acceleration features, have very much same memory system as a GPU. So it's a very non-conventional uh, processor uh, built with uh, heterogeneity in acceleration of, uh, you know, of tr or more akin to traditional vector, vector processing. And if you remember, old vector processors, there's always a vector unit and a scalar unit. So you know, or even old vector machines are heterogeneous in, uh, in that regard. But, but then you have to remember that, um, but these, but, you know, compared to standard CPU, pure standard CPU, these uh, systems are always difficult to program and also uh, difficult to, you know, integrate, uh, integrate in various ways and so forth. And, you know, Bob covers some of this, or you know, software problems, algorithm problems, and so forth. But uh, I don't have time to go into that. And, but, you know, and that's, that's all agreeable. But what I'd like to focus on is, you know, uh, the performance, the way we gain performance is always governed by both Amdahl's law and Gustav's law, okay? So from that context, what, what John Schaff advocated, although he's my very good friend and we work, we work together, it's advocated having all these heterogeneous components you have to kind of master and then pull together and, uh, to construct an application is a very bad idea. Okay. That's, that's because it's not going to work, in, at least at scale. It may work for cell phones, but it will not work for you know, high performance computing. And um, so what I mean by homogenous is workloads need to be mostly confined to a single acceleration type. Okay. Otherwise, it will not. That's the only way to overcome Amazon's law by use of the Gustav's law, which is a very classic concept. Okay. And all the successful applications on like things like Fugaku and also like GPU machines, everything follows this, follows this principle. And uh, let me tell you why. And, uh, I have a few, few more minutes, but um, so you know, Amazon's law is very simple. You know, we get very sketchy description of both laws. Amazon's law, we all know, there's non-accelerated component and accelerated component. And no matter how much you, you know, is it always bound by the, the your performance increase is always governed by the non-accelerated component. You can make the accelerated co co component infinitely fast, but you'll also always be limited by the non-acceleration. Okay, so that's how and that's why, you know, people thought in parallel computing will not work. And that's why Gordon Bell Prize emanated and all that. There's history of that. And that was overcome by Gustafson Law, where you don't change the time to solution. But because you increase the uh, you weak, you basically you, you weak scale, so you have more and more parallels of components, but are uniform, uniformly parallelized. So you increase the data set, but you uniformly parallelize. You chop them up in a very uniform way, and so what happens is you get more performance. The time solution is the same, but you get more performance, and the non-parallelization component of the performance limitation shrinks proportionally. And that's why you know, we get a Fugaku, which is 8 million CPU core system, and we get speed up, you know, 8 million times speed up on these CPUs. That's exactly how we do it. So here, so here you have to remember that uh, the keyword, these parallelized components have to be uniform. They have to be load balanced properly, okay? And, and uh, the, in fact, that's the most important thing in parallel computing, and that's why the test of time achievement board this paper that was awarded was on graph partitioning because the graph partitioning is the key to load balance. Okay. So, um, so when we combine these two laws, okay, so you have these non-accelerated component, but the acceleration component shrinks. Right. So it's very, very, very hard to get load balancing because it's, it's so, so it becomes such a tiny element. 
So, uh, so intranode heterogeneous processing becomes a really bad idea in this context because dominant processing should be done uh, unless it's done a dominant accelerator. It's, it'd be super difficult to do any sort of load balancing. Extre um, the extreme event, how to achieve that? Well, SPMD processing over uniform accelerators is the best way to achieve this. Plethora of heterogeneous components interacting in a task parallel way, that's not going to work. Okay? It may work for small scale systems, but not for large systems. And, you know, there are many other reasons I, you know, that, you know, that I can cite, and lack, due to lack of time, we'll go into details. But, uh, and, but these communication overhead also has to be very low. Because again, if you have variance in communication or like noise in the operating system, that's going to kill load balancing. Okay, so so it's no so it's no accident so okay. it's no accident that every successful large-scale accelerated supercomputers, especially GPUs, machine, but also machine like Yaku, are homogeneous, and the algorithms that are run on these uh, uh, on these machines are also homogeneous in a sense that they run the SPMD programs with uniformly split domain decomposed programs on every dominant on the GPU. Because on the GPU machine, you want the, the XSI GPU in most cases because, because there are more of them and they're faster. On Fugaku, then you know, XSI is exercised by CPU. And that's how Tsubame was built by my, my previous machines. That's how Titan's built. That's how ABC, I my previous machine. Fugaku, Frontier, everything. All the machines are built there. And this is a consequence of physical laws. So this will continue to be applicable to future machines. There's no still way around it. And the only other, the only case I can think of where you can have all these heterogeneous components, uh, different types of heterogeneous components interacting is when you have like a Monte Carlo sampling when there are no dependencies between tasks. That's the only case I can think of where these will be useful. Okay, with that, uh, there are more to come, but uh, I'll end that here. Great, thank you, Satoshi. Our, our next panelist is uh, James. Thank you for joining us, James. Yes, oh, okay. So I will share my screen and uh, which Sensei, you will need to, I'll share, okay. 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 Well, can you, can you share, see my screen? Yes. Oh. Okay, so I will um, uh, briefly introduce my experience on this one. So my uh, very short talk was in Korean two parts. So I'm currently the vice director of the HPC Science Center in Shanghai Jiaotong University. I received my PhD from Tokyo Tech and under the supervisor of Professor Satoshi Matsuka. And uh, uh, my research in just made a increment two parts. The first is processes. So I benchmarked the, the some way processes. And also I have uh, doing some large scale ap applications. And the first one is we have doing the largest cos cosmological embodied simulation with 4.4 trillion particles, which is uh, only on the CPU. And the second part of the recent work is we, we uh, develop a parallel version of alpha fold, which can increase the performance of 10, uh, 10, time, 10 times uh, with the CPU op 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 optimizing and, and the GPU optimizing. So uh, here is the code. And here is the hardware I have used in my research. The first is the NVIDIA GPU. And then in uh, then comes with the in, Intel Nest Corner. And uh, during my PhD study, I work on the Shum, Shumi trip. And uh, after that, I using a uh, made focus on the arm now. And uh, here is the heterogeneous hardware I have managed in, in, uh, for my university. We have AI uh, with the GPU one and the HPC and the ARM. The latest one is the CPU and GPU hybrid uh, Lenovo HPC, which was the 
number one in the China universities. So, uh, so I I would like to present the two new processors. So, as you may know, there's two exascale level supercomputers which were, uh, which are not on the top 500 list. Uh, the one was used on the Sunwei processors, and uh, this is in the new Sunwei supercomputers. And uh, the application was uh, selected for the Golden Bell final list. The second one is the ARM, ARM version 8 processors for the Tianke supercomputer prototype. And, uh, and uh, if, if you go into the Golden Bell Final list session, you will know the de detail of the processors. So this is basically the homo homogeneous processor, but with a large core with MPE and uh, and uh, the other uh, the other C, uh, small CPEs. So, but the programming on these kinds of processors is quite hard as uh, you will need to do some tricks like the re just level communication or within the core, you will need to write assembly code. So this is kind of the ninja programming. And also with the new uh, ARM version 8 uh, processor, since we were using the new 10, 10 3 supercomputers, is the combined with the ARM uh, processor and with the matrix accelerators uh, as can, can uh, as the specification can be seen. So this is uh, the end of my talk. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, James. Uh, on next panelist, Peter. Let me unshare. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, close uh, close this um, introductory remarks with a few of my own. Uh, so uh, let me start with the uh, anniversary that we had uh, this year, 42nd anniversary of the Hitchhiker's Guide. Uh, and uh, but the other thing that happened also 40 years ago uh, was um, let's see, there it is. Uh, so 886 happened also 42 years ago. And that you could think of as the OG of the killer mic micros, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the grandfather of all the uh, homogeneous uh, processors um, uh, out there. Uh, on the other hand, if you look uh, 42 days ago, uh, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> rounding up, the release of Apple M1 happened, also supposedly a homogeneous uh, processor for the laptops. However, if you look under the uh, uh, under the hood, you see that it is actually uh, full of uh, 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 heterogeneous components, and we also saw that um, uh, with the uh, on, on Satoshi slides that you pretty much have a little uh, cluster of components with a network and uh, an even a neural engine that is uh, supplementing the, the GPU on the uh, on this chip. And so Apple calls it the uh, the chiplet design, and so basically it just gives them an excuse to. Uh, to make these uh, CPUs uh, more and more uh, heterogeneous, and uh, uh, many other vendors uh, do, do the same thing. Uh, pretty much these days, almost everybody makes their own uh, ARM processors, as we uh, heard from the uh, panelists. So um, if you look at the, uh, uh, the GPU accelerators, uh, they, they're also very heterogeneous inside with different precisions, uh, different um, fixed point and floating point formats, and different acceleration units. But from, uh, from my perspective, the, uh, the important part comes uh, here at the bottom, uh, that we have a proliferation of different uh, floating point uh, precisions and the uh, integer ones. And we heard uh, from other panelists that the, um, uh, that's, uh, that's where it's going. And we, uh, if we even take a broader view, uh, I try to uh, put uh, a number of, of startups that uh, have the uh, different uh, levels of the, of the hardware available in the market. There are plenty more, it's just that I wanted to leave this slide uh, readable. And on the right, you kind of have the progression of the precisions in the um, in, in NVIDIA, NVIDIA chips. So, chips. so uh, we see that these, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, different precisions being introduced. 
and, and in a way that kind of suggests this, this uh, heterogeneity is, is here to stay. So uh, uh, when you ask yourself a question, well, let's see. Where, where, where it comes from, uh, it comes, of course, uh, from, the, from the basic physics uh, fact that uh, we, uh, we compute with the electrons and we also communicate with the electrons and that, that the cost us. So on the, uh, <clears throat> on the x-axis, I just put the um, uh, different uh, fixed point and floating point uh, precisions and how much uh, energy they consume. So that's the, uh, that's the vert vertical axis. So we're becoming, uh, as, as other panels also mentioned, we're becoming the bean counters of these, uh, of these picojoules of, of computing on these uh, elementary uh, processing units. But the most costly part is in the, in the bright red. That, that is the communication. Again, the, uh, the electrons just happen to have some mass, and moving them from uh, place to place requires, uh, requires energy. Ideally, we should use photons, but, uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, so, and... Uh, uh, to kind of uh, summarize it uh, historically, you, you probably uh, have seen that, that slide from the OpenAI that summarized the uh, <clears throat> progression from the, from the 60s of the, of the uh, 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 Rosenblatt perceptron that is basically assembled by hand all the way down to the, um, to the recent advances in, in deep learning. So I, uh, w what I did is I somewhat whimsically uh, decorated this, um, uh, this chart. So I put the, uh, in 1965, I put the, uh, I put the, the cramming paper by, uh, by Moore, kind of the, the start of the, uh, uh, the Moore's law era, and everything uh, that, that started uh, then until the, the, the recent advances with these uh, al alternative precisions, this is where it was the um, homogeneity in hardware. It was the king, and, uh, and everybody wanted to be a, a general purpose. At some point, we even called the, uh, some of the GPUs to be a uh, general purpose, even though they weren't really uh, the same general purpose kind that, that the CPU was. So, um, so we can say that, that this era is over, and the, the amount of computing that we require uh, will, uh, will uh, necessitate heterogeneity. So um, as one of the problems from the panel, what do we do about it? So here are some uh, examples the way we used mixed precision. Here is a mixed precision GMRAS. Uh, using the different precisions, even trying to do integer uh, arithmetic. Again, not to, not to bore you with the slides and what they really mean. It, it is possible to, uh, to converge under some, con uh, some conditions. So now we can expose in our software uh, a kind of uh, a tuning knob and say, uh, tell me something about your problem and I'll, and I'll tell you uh, which, uh, which part of your chip, which, part of the, which, which, the, which precision uh, I should be using under, uh, underneath. Uh, similarly, if we look at the uh, eigenvalue problems, so uh, you see the uh, multiple curves. There is the, the, the red curves and the blue curves. Blue curves are the, the, the eigenvalues that converge nicely and quickly, and they can use a lower precision. So again, we expose it to the user, and then the user comes back in and says, well, no, I have more of those, uh, of those red eigenvalues. I don't need that many, but I need a few of them. Well, uh, we, we can tell them, yeah, okay, use it, and then we have to switch to another part of the, of the chip where the uh, uh, higher precision should be used. And, and finally, uh, we also switch to uh, mixed precision benchmarking uh, with the uh, HPL AI benchmark. So uh, I think Hatem opened up with the uh, top 500. Uh, let, me, uh, let me switch to the uh, kind of a complement of top 500 HPL AI. It just so happens that um, uh, Satoshi's favorite computer is also number one on this list, and on, in the last column, you can see that uh, using these mixed precision ideas gives uh, a very nice speed up, but by taking advantage of um, multiple different parts of the chip whenever, whenever necessary and whenever uh, possible. So that, that would be the uh, end of my remarks. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. All right, so um, we'll start the Q&A. Uh, <laughs> let me address the elephant in the room here. So today, uh, you know, Fugaku remains number one, right, for the four benchmarks. Uh, do we really need to bother with heterogeneity in hardware? All right, so I'd like Satoshi to oh, address that okay. question first, and uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe um, I can show, not precisely answer that question, but uh -huh. let me show a slide just to, uh, oh, how do I share the screen again? Um, to, to answer that question. So again, uh, uh, or my, you know, heter my, you know, what I said, the heterogeneity is a means to an end. Right? So, 
the big, bigger question is how do we get continued speed up, um, uh, uh, you know, sustainable speed up, not, not just one time, but sustainable speed up in, in the coming years. So that's, that's a bigger question. And then if heterogene, you know, have heterogeneous components within a chip or you know, as a separate, uh, so a separate chip or whatever, or chiplet or whatever, you know, if that's the way to achieve it, then that's, you know, that's, that's great. And in fact, but that's more of Amdahl's acceleration. Then beyond that, of course, you know, the same argument for Gustav's law. Gustav's in speed up the whole. So, um, so if we have heterogeneous components, maybe it'll help to speed things up on a, on a single chip basis. Okay, and, but what's that? Okay, so, yeah, so here's a slide. Uh, here's what we're foreseeing. Um, uh, so yeah, we have, uh, you know, have various algorithms, okay, that are kernels, uh, that are basically kernels of any application. And this is not just for HPC, but for given any sort of application that require performance, you know, they're composed of different types of uh, you know, numerical kernels. Uh, even natural language is also like that because they're transform kernels. So uh, on the right hand, hand side, you know, this is uh, originally a slide given by Fujitsu, uh, but I modify it to think about the algorithmic evolution. And you have all these, uh, um, a lot of, uh, we did a lot of survey of these algorithms uh, currently as well. And of course for HPC, we found, find that most of the algorithms are, you know, data bound or, you know, movement or, or sometimes latency bound, but mostly memory or data movement bound, okay? But there are some like Hartley Fogg for, you know, convolutional network that are a little bit higher order. Yeah, and then you have the realm where it's uh, like exponential and, and be hard problems that are like optimizations, okay? So, but we have a plethora of these complexities, but right now uh, somewhat dominated by data movement. And when we look at the future, uh, where, can, where can we be? Well, we know, all know that Moore's law is ending. Well, it's still proceeding. If you look at the you know, new AMD announcement, they packed in a lot of flops, but they eliminated a lot of uh, internal memory, so we'll see how the chip performs in reality, okay. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, a uh, company like M NVIDIA have been really um, good at putting more and more uh, storage into the chip, which I think is a, is a much better thing to, uh, to impact flops. Because, and because the Moore's Law is ending, uh, will be ending soon, um, uh, there's only, the only way to achieve speed up is actually to exploit the other factors, like you know, packaging and uh, other things, which will reduce uh, data movement, uh, the energy for data movement. So that will mean that the algorithm will have to follow the strength that uh, we go to lower, instead of going to higher order algorithms, we go to lower order algorithms. Like, for example, even for dense matrices, we do you know, H matrix approximations, or SVD, where you do H, H matrix approximation. But essentially, that is to sparsify the matrix and use sparse algorithms. So with that, uh, uh, and we're uh, all doing research on these things like, you know, even some of the quantum chemistry codes we're looking at, like big DFT or, uh, or some of the other uh, algorithms where we can get linear, you know, we can get uh, linear time algorithms for very large, you know, uh, uh, you know wave, function, wave function type of codes. And uh, as, we go and, uh, as we go and convert these, um, uh, these algorithms to be more lower order, then the acceleration of heterogeneity is basically to optimize a data path. Not to put more CAC or L use in the system, but to optimize the data path, customize the data path for speed up. And ultimately, you know, you know uh, at the MP hard level, we can't do anything. So the only thing, only hope is quantum, but uh, you know, I'll, that's a whole other story about that. I'll skip all that sort of stuff and leave it to my uh, wider talk. But basically, heterogeneity, if at all, will be effective will have to, you know, for the evolution, continued evolution, but we have to think about data path optimization. Yeah. But how do we do that? Well, there are technologies to do it, but again, we really have to think of, you know, these algorithms, how we accelerate it, and even change the algorithms to exploit the characteristic, evolutionary character, not, not just one time, but evolutionary characteristics of how, you know, how the photography, the packaging, all the chips are being developed. Um, so uh, uh, the heterogeneity is coming to an end. That's what uh, you know. Satoshi means to end. Means to end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, means to end. Yeah. Got you. Means to end. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. It's so just a, it's just a, it's a method. Sure. Yeah. yeah. If we don't need heterogeneity, we we shouldn't do it. But yeah. Yeah. So uh, Bob or Anima, would you like to uh, respond to this as a vendor? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, a a absolutely. I, you know, um, as Satoshi said he was going to be controversial, but I think we actually said the same thing. And and let me and let me and let me tell you why. So maybe that's a controversial statement, but um, I, I, you know, nobody. I don't think anybody. I think everybody is going to agree that nobody just wants to put all transistors and dedicate them to, to you know, what the, the 8086 did in terms of scalar compute. If you listen to Satoshi and you look at his diagrams, there's, there's lots of different types of compute that, that's going on. I think all of the panelists in one form or another have agreed that nobody wants to go back and just, um, you know, use X80, you know, 8086 uh, cores, even if they were, you know, super fast for, for their compute. Be, be, and the reason is, you know, like I argued, it's because we really need this performance per cost of performance per power. But if you think about what I said in, in my talk, um, what we want to expose to the programmer is a homogeneous environment, right? So it, it's really, it's not a question of whether there's heterogeneity under the hood. Everybody said that. Um, and I, and I, I, I haven't heard anybody say you know, the ideal thing to expose to the programmer is, is a whole mishmash of a whole bunch of different things. Um, you know, a whole bunch of different programming environments, a whole bunch of different hardware. So I think the real question, and you know, maybe what we should be driving at is, you know, at what level do we try to, um, you know, provide an abstraction of underlying heterogeneity, but, but, you know, moving north, provide a homogeneous environment, right? And so, um, you know, what Pierta argued, was well, I mean, you know, the, the the Apple chip is actually heterogeneous underneath, but they're really saying it's just the CPU, right? And um, so it's it's really just a question of granularity, and there's both hardware granularity, right? You can do it all in a chip. Um, Intel and other companies are, are leveraging additional packaging, so you can do it all within a package. Um, there's even some supercomputer centers that are exploring it, doing it at a much coarser granularity. But but in the end, I. Think we're all aligned and maybe i'll put this out there and see what the other panelists think in the end what we want to expose to the application developer you know to the software layers is something that is you know homogeneous in that you're programming one thing there might be some complexity underneath the covers behind it and yeah maybe some of the low levels need to do some sophistication but we we don't want to provide this you know me, me, mesh of uh, me, me, sorry mix of, you know, mess of stuff up to the application developer. So I'll put that out there as, as a way to, and I hope that, you know, we'll see whether it's controversial or not, but that, I think that's a way to bring together a lot of the, you know, perhaps what might have seemed to be disparate views. I think in some sense, we're saying a lot of the same things. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, you know, to me, I, you know, heterogeneity is something that's inevitable, right? Especially if we go to the edge and uh, it's no longer all, a tightly knit uh, supercomputer, we will see heterogeneity of devices, you know, so if we also want uh, uh, fast communication between them, then it's inevitable, right, and to Bob's point, it's really the software, right, that needs to be easily usable, and we're always going up the stack, right, so if you think about the full stack that NVIDIA has, uh, you know, at the very top, we even have like application specific, easy to use containers, right? So people can start downloading uh, pre-trained models, uh, having like uh, AI assisted annotation, for instance, in our Clara healthcare platform. So that becomes, you know, there is something very specific to the domain, but there is also, right, languages like PyTorch or TensorFlow, which is the level at which most AI researchers uh, interact with, right? And then, uh, of course, the question is how do we make the layers below that uh, uh, much more efficient so that most people don't have to go below, right? So, and that's where like kind of designing efficient kernels and further automating that design, right? So with every new generation of chips, uh, you know, do we have to hand design performance optimizations versus using AI to make that efficient, right? I mean, we talked a lot about different kinds of mixed precision, you know, with every new format, uh, you know, is this something that has to be hand tuned and how does a, right, a general AI programmer know about this how and how to select, can we automate that? So I think like the broad theme to me is we've been thinking about 
hardware for AI, but AI for hardware is the future, right? So all the way from chip design, uh, you know, layouts to performance optimization. And I think that's the way to deal with heterogeneity. Thank you, Anima. Okay, so this is uh, like more a question in co-design algorithm and soft application. So if uh, Laura and then uh, James and Piotr can uh, uh, chime in. So we know like it's all about application performance after all. So from uh, an algorithmic uh, innovation perspective, how can we leverage performance of the uh, underlying uh, hardware architecture? So is it time to foster hardware software co-design effort to facilitate the adoption of emerging technology in software and application? Uh, so dur yeah, during the introductory talk or remarks, we, we heard about mixed precision. We heard about you know, Ninja programming, right? So uh, how can we come up with standards? Uh, you know, to ease the programming, to ease the deployment of uh, those algorithms onto those emerging architecture, right? So I'd like to hear, yeah, from Laurent, perhaps first. Um. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, yes, the discussion was a lot about software, hardware co-design, but it's true that we have to involve applications because uh, we do learn a lot from them. I mean, I think uh, well, um, um, Nima mentioned tensor trains and tensor networks. And then when you look at quantum chemistry, that's where some of the methods were designed and uh, tensor train is coming from them in some sense. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's important to involve uh, applications, knowing that going forward, I think Satoshi said that it's important to exploit data sparsity, and uh, you really have to get close to this application to understand where where data sparsity can be exploited. Uh, it, it's important. Uh, now, I, I think there was some discussion in the past. Uh, are there many examples of successful hardware software co-design? Not, not that many. <laughs> If you think, but yeah, maybe that's a bit controversial, but uh, we don't have that many examples. From my point of view, algorithmic point of view, I do have to follow the hardware. I do have to understand what are the trends coming. Is it really realistic that communication is going to be really come really become uh, cheap? So. I think I, I'm following the hardware trends. I'm getting close to applications to understand the specifics of these applications and and then have a algorithmic which adapts to everything. But standards are important. Yeah, so I, I guess that's, that's a really important point that we do have to develop standards yes. going forward. Thank you, Laura. James, you want to say a few things about your experience? You know, you mentioned Ninja programming, right? So um, we are not uh, all Ninja programming. <laughs> so can you, uh, you know, uh, describe a bit your own experience and perhaps how you could facilitate uh, the deployment of, uh, you know, algorithm onto your own, uh, you know, hardware? Sure, sure, sure. sure. So uh, in, my, in my opinion, there could be three levels of pole, uh, pole programming. The very low level says as as we see the ninja programming this this kind of level and the mi middle level I think it's kind of like like the cool cool down on the GPU and also the high level is the open ACC. so I think for the most of the pe people the middle level is ac acceptable so the CUDA is widely used on the open CC or uh, how However, the uh, 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 the CUDA is widely used on the GPU. However, the OpenSSC, as you can see, also is has application to uh, applied to some of application. But if you want to the high performance on the GPU, you you will still want to use the CUDA. So consider the chip on the Sunway supercomputer. So why the programming is so hard on this Sunway supercomputer? Because there is missing of the middle level. So they have pro provided the two methods. The, the one is the OpenSCC. OpenSCC is compatible uh, with the Sunway supercomputer, but with very low performance. And uh, they, so if you want to uh, have the out 
ultimate performance, you have to use the Ninja programming. So although the most uh, large scale of application running on that, but the programming is very hard. So I think the next step is we will try to pro provide the middle level programming for this kind of supercomputers. Okay. Thank you, James. Um, Peter, you talked about uh, mixed precision, right? So, uh, you know, this is a, a great opportunity, but at the same time, this is, uh, you know, daunting, right? So this is scary for domain scientists who perhaps don't want to lose any digits. They are scared about uh, doing any type of approximation, whether algebraic or using, you know, mixed precision with hardware support. How can you, or what are your thoughts on how can this be uh, facilitated for end users and domain scientists? Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's I indeed, I mean, the, uh, the, the science is, is a relentless pursuit of, of more, more accurate and uh, more precise results. So uh, they, they, they often come in and say, like, using all these lower precision formats will, will degrade and uh, the, the, the answers that we get, we might not be able to understand. But uh, luckily for us, uh, the, uh, the, us as the library developers, uh, and the designers of the numerical algorithms, we're not the only ones that are struggling with the uh, uh, onslaught of this, of this data format. The same happens for the, uh, for the storage folks. They get, um, uh, they get uh, asked to, uh, to communicate with less data and they ask to, to save less data to either the checkpoints or, or to, uh, to persistent storage. And, and so uh, new efforts for, for data compression, on the fly data compression, uh, it influences that uh, a lot, and so that uh, that is also another angle where they see that actually doing uh, 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 first lossless compression and then um, and then a compression where they actually lose the data, it's it's that they can adapt to it and they can still get the results uh, because the uh, what what happens is that if if you start using these precisions, you, you just kind of learn to to iterate to start with a. Uh, so so approximation and they uh, and then iterate and you build it to almost uh, everything uh, everything that, that that you do and and we're trying to push that into uh, into a multiple standard so the um, we worked for uh, uh, for many years on the uh, batched uh, batch plus interfaces where these uh, the small matrices would not work well on the accelerators in, in, in the heterogeneous setting but now with the batch plus standard incorporated by pretty much all the vendors, now we can basically just uh, solve at once all multiple of these systems. Uh, we have uh, we have another another effort right now. So uh, Laura mentioned the randomized algorithms. So we're uh, we're putting out together uh, extensive documents with uh, something that you would call the uh, a randomized LA path. So this would be the de facto standard of all these randomized algorithms put in one place. And that would allow people take it and, and uh, uh, either use it as is, if it's if it's good enough, and if it's not, maybe uh, other people would, would optimize it. But the standard would define uh, what the what these algorithms are. So and and we also trying uh, trying to use new languages. So we also have an effort to put in uh, C plus plus twenty three standard uh, uh, the the blast blast like interfaces. That use modern C++ and uh, and can work with uh, layouts that are really not supported by the uh, by the legacy blast. So uh, we recognize that, and these are the, our efforts that uh, to to, make, to solve that. So I wanted to uh, quickly add that I completely agree. Right. So regarding the resistance to use uh, mixed precision, uh, especially by many domain scientists, I think the you know uh, thought process is we need to get the highest. Uh, a precision ever, right? But there are so many modeling errors, right? No model is perfect. And so when in our experience of, um, you know, using AI methods uh, instead of the traditional numerical simulations, we can do with much less precision. And, and even though like some of the intermediate computations uh, may not be that accurate in the end, fitting to data, you can uh, get uh, very good results. So, you know, for instance, I'll show the weather simulation where, uh, we can uh, do it 100,000 times faster than uh, the current numerical solvers, uh, but still do it in high resolution compared to the 
previous AI methods, right? And be able to accurately predict extreme events like hurricanes. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, there is the aspect that, you know, people think that if you maintain uh, accuracy and precision at every step, overall, the end result will be good, but don't take into account uh, modeling errors. Uh, we see the same with the quantum chemistry, you know, the DFT calculations are the uh, HPC, right, uh, applications, but we've used AI methods that can be a thousand times faster than DFT. Uh, but at the same time, give uh, good results in like say geometry optimization and other chemistry applications. So I think the AI is what will enable us to scale to much bigger problems. And, you know, like some of the intermediate accuracy, if we give up, there is a lot we can gain from that. Okay. So, um, yeah, so, okay. So, so this is sort of, um, uh, Enhancing what James had said, because you know, he was my student, he had some experience, you know, trying out the Shenwei processor, and why did it require Ninja programmer to program? Okay, and uh, so it kind of all correlates the software, hardware, the algorithms, and so forth. Because um, you know, uh, with the uh, we've been amazingly successful in parallel computing. Um, we've been GPUs have been very successful uh, as well, and uh, it turns out that describing um, computation in terms of parallelism is something you can do. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's CUDA, there's all all kinds of uh, uh, variants of parallel languages have have come to fruition, and OpenMP, SO says, etc. So those four, and also uh, again the parallel hardware. Um, it turns out that um, there's not much need uh, once you're in confined within each, uh, each uh, accelerated component, you don't really need to move the data because, like I said, in order to be successful, you need to confine the computation within that component uh, or else you're gonna destruct the load balancing. So uh, that's why machine like Subami, like Subami 2 or any other machines that have very poor PCIe bandwidth compared to, let's say, massive bandwidth of a GPU. And you try to, you know, in the past we tried all these uh, research, moving, try to optimize data movement between, like, say, CPU and GPU, but that was not necessary because you're confining your data to be on the GPU, and it's very seldom that you move, and th and that's what was required to get performance. Okay, so so it kind of all parallel. So describing parallelism is okay, but what's going to be difficult uh, ahead? For these, uh, is, uh, is, like I said, we need to optimize the data path, data movement, and that's what's really hard. And, and, and this is exactly what the situation with the, with the, with the, uh, you know, with the Shenwei processor. So describing parallels in the Shenwei processor is, is trivial. But Shenwei required ninja programming skills, I won't go into details, you, know, you can read James's paper if you want. Um, you require an enormous effort, ninja programmer effort, to optimize the data movement so that it works, okay? And it's completely non-standard. And I'm afraid that this will be the case because uh, every sort of compute pattern will have different types of optimizations required to optimize this data movement. So uh, there could be some standardization, but every sort of standardization efforts I know to try to optimize data movement have not been too successful. You may claim for some legion, uh, maybe a little bit successful, but that, that, that's a very macro level. For dense compute, like, you know, for dense linear algebra, this was not needed because you're going to get reuse and things get automated. You know, the cache system is automated, register allocation is automated. That's why it was important. So, but we have to take a lesson from this. So, it's uh, optimizing data movement is too difficult for humans because it's an uh, MP hard problem. So the only way to tackle this is automation, uh, by the use of AI, by the way, or you know, AI or any other means, or quantum or whatever, or some smart uh, optimization algorithm. But again, um, so the only way is to have some standardization effort so that some uh, machine intelligence can come in, just like we automate register allocations, just like we automate you know, the L uh, caches, so semi-automated, that we optimize data movement by the use of these automated techniques. And, and, and then the programmers will describe parallelism and, uh, you know, and that'll, be a, you know, that'll be a dream world. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Sisson. We have uh, like several questions from the audience, and thank mm -hmm. you. So by the way, like, the slider will fly later on. 
to uh, to answer them by the panelists. So we have like a, uh, a few questions. So we we'll try to gather into one. And so if uh, I will uh, give the, the mic to Bob. So how can a single software ecosystem be successful if it is only w uh, led by one company? How about having the government, the industry, academic partners led by a VR community? And to follow up also, like how we uh, can afford like custom hardware design without a big market? So because we know like it's quite expensive to do it. I'm sorry, I, I got the first half. Could you just repeat the second half of the question? I'm sorry? I, I understood the first, I got the first half of the question. I didn't quite understand the second half. Could you just repeat the second portion of the question? So uh, uh, like the, uh, the question is, the second one is how uh, to afford custom hardware design without a big market. Ah, oh yeah, okay, okay. So they're slightly different, great. Okay, well let, let's start with the, I wasn't sure if they were tied together. So let, let's start with the first one. So I assume that the question is referring to one API and um, Intel is explicitly not trying to make one API be an Intel product. We are, we are working very extensively with other um, partners, other vendors, other customers, other labs. Um, you know, for example, um, Intel itself invested a significant effort with uh, CodePlay early on to make sure that one API worked on top of NVIDIA architecture. And since the DOE has picked up the effort and is continuing to drive that on top of um, AMD. This is GPU, obviously it works on top of CPU architectures just out of the box. So, um, and, and we absolutely are reaching out to the community and intending for this to be a, a very, you know, open source like type, open community like type um, engagement. So um, I, I do hear that a lot. I, you know, I always kind of wonder why that happens. I can tell you, you know, both our, our intent as well as, you know, all of the leads on One API um, really do want to make it an, an open community uh, thing. So hopefully I, I dispel that at least in this small audience and maybe everybody can get the word out. Um, so, you know, now I think that the second question was, um, and let me just repeat it to make sure that I'm understanding, which is, um, you know, how can we afford to uh, design, you know, the, the, the cost to design new hardware is expensive. How can we afford to design custom hardware? And so um, I, it, you know, it, it depends on what you mean by custom hardware. You know, I would say that there's a few sort of um, probably international, but it's certainly at least domestic uh, government agencies who do look for very specialized hardware. Bitcoin, you know, we might argue um, is a very, or, you know, coin mining or um, might be a, uh, a very uh, specialized hardware. So, you know, I, I, I think I agree with the premise of the question, which is by and large, except in a few isolated cases, um, we don't design, you know, full-blown large custom hardware anymore we are moving towards a place where we are trying to design when i talk about the scalar vector spatial and matrix you know we are looking for you know within each of these categories as we design it we are looking for general type general compute engines that fit into each of these categories and then you know the question you know pursuant to the com comments i made earlier on is how do we then seam seamlessly or transparently from the developer application developer point of view allow you just to describe as satoshi indicated the parallelism that exists in the application and then map it to um you know the right underlying vehicle to to deliver it yeah and anima you want to say a uh, few words about cuda for instance i know cuda of course is uh, is uh, really mature and uh, how do you perhaps position yourself here with regards to this question Understand. Yeah, I mean, yeah, indeed, uh, right. Uh, you know, CUDA really revolutionized uh, GPU programming, right? So, uh, you know, when I talked to some of the colleagues here at Caltech, you know, that's when they said, okay, we'll have a course on GPUs. And uh, because before that, it required ninja programming, like James earlier mentioned. And so, what we've been doing is, uh, right, to really reach out to more and more developers. You know, right now, I think it's about 30 million developers. And also, really, to build abstractions on top, right? Like, you know, thinking about Tensor RT, right, for fast inference or automatic mixed precision, all these like developments that sit at a level higher because for most, especially AI programmers, you know, they want to 
work on Python and not worry about things below. So it's really now moving even above CUDA. Um, so with regards to the other aspect of, you know, how do we, you know, raise funding and indeed, right, the chip shortage is something that uh, everybody here is on the top of our minds and, uh, you know, increasing the competitiveness uh, globally, right, I think every country uh, should uh, think about investing and, uh, you know, finding ways to, and I know Intel here is uh, right, really planning to it's going to take a few years, but I think ultimately everything, the demand is going through the roof. So this is very important to think about and the government needs to enhance funding for academia as well to do research on new custom hardware. Uh, you know, this is based on the experience here at Caltech. Uh, you know, we uh, recently uh, got a uh, chip done uh, from TSMC and like looking at really this hardware software co-design, right? That, Laura mentioned doesn't happen a lot. And so how do we, you know, think about other paradigms of computing and uh, focus on the energy efficiency angle. Uh, so I think there is a lot that academia can also contribute, uh, but, you know, we need good sources of funding. Uh, in fact, Carver Meet here at Caltech, right, more than 30 or 40 years ago talked about the lack of uh, hardware facilities for academics uh, working on chip design, and that still is an issue. Um, so I think hopefully, you know, industry partnerships and more investment will help us here. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Anima. Uh, I'd like to uh, also um, say one thing about uh, perhaps, you know, we have not really emphasized is uh, algorithmic innovation. I know Laura talked about randomization method uh, Peter talked about mix, uh, mixed precision, and I think it's uh, also important to perhaps uh, you know revisit algorithms that have been there for a long time, but they were simply uh, not at a good time. They have been discovered not at a good time, at a time where flops were expensive, and there are many actually uh, uh, you know those algorithms available out there. We should really go back to them and see if you know uh, it's a good time for them to. Uh, to excel and, and, and get deployed on massively parallel you know, hardware uh, architecture. I have a few examples of this. Uh, you know, this sometimes means also you have to redesign your own application, and this is also something that uh, you know, uh, users are perhaps reluctant in doing so. Uh, but you know, we've seen really uh, you know, uh, looking at PDE stencil-based you know, computation, trying to move those data uh, you know, on memory-bound operation and redesign the algorithm to make it more like uh, a matrix matrix multiplication. That's possible, that's doable, but at the price of doing extra operation, extra flops, right, than the uh, standard way. And I think, you know, there is a huge opportunity uh, out there to, uh, to, to try to leverage uh, those, uh, you know, uh, uh, tensor core hardware features from NVIDIA or from AMD and other, uh, you know, vendors, uh, and see if instead of, uh, you know, blaming sort of the, uh, you know, those AI-based feature, hardware features, perhaps we could use them for our traditional HPC simulation, right? So that's also something that uh, I believe we should, uh, you know, uh, try to, uh, uh, you know, uh, identify and investigate and, and, and see how we could leverage that. Um, do we have any final remark? I guess uh, we're uh, gonna just make a, a quick turnaround for the uh, three minutes that we have left. Uh, and uh, uh, you wanna, yeah, maybe, we'll, you want to take? Go, go ahead. Yeah. Let them like so, a short yeah, go ahead. Maybe uh, 30 seconds each. Uh, we're about to wrap up. Yeah. So, Peter, you first. Well, so uh, I, I, I believe that uh, many panelists make excellent points, and I think heterogeneity is uh, he's here to stay. And maybe even reluctantly, Satoshi kind of said that heterogeneity means to an end. So, depending on what our ends are, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be stuck with it. Thank you. Yeah, so. Um, you know, uh, homo again, homogeneity is a key to success of heterogeneity in supercomputing. And we have to distinguish that from the you know, success of the cell phones or laptops, okay? Uh, so we really have to think about the principles, the fundamental principles of how we achieve performance. Otherwise, we'll get, you know, uh, mixed, you know, we'll get mixed messages uh, you know, with, um, you know, that are not slightly correct for, um, for you know, various cases or, you know, even marketing stuff. So, so we really have to think about the grounding principles of how algorithms evolve, how the lithography evolve, how the architecture evolve, in order to really do the right thing with heterogeneity. Okay, we shouldn't be 
persuaded by these single instance successes. We, we gotta do the right thing, pat, pat moving forward. Thank you. James? Uh, I think as Mazuka said, just said, if we can aut aut automatic uh, data movement with Python AI method, that will be good to ease the poll poll where I mean hard. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bob? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just sort of reiterate that it, it seems like we're all agreeing that in one form or another, we're going to have different types of transistors. And in the end, I think what we need to focus on as a community and, and really understand is how we bring that um, underlying heterogeneity, which we all agree exists at some level, up to being a very productive um, a programming model um, for the application. And a big part of that, I believe, is, is, is doing a co-design and providing a, a very productive uh, programming development environment. One final slide, please. <laughs> Go ahead. So, but are there others? Yes, yeah. of course. Uh, we, uh, so, Laura, please, go ahead. Yeah, so I think I'm a bit in the middle in the algorithmic development part in between hardware developments and uh, applications requirements. And I, I'm taking heterogeneity as an opportunity for really, you know, innovating in terms of algorithms. And uh, as Hatem said, I think algorithms still play a, a big role because first you have to have those algorithms which work for complex, uh, for complex applications and aim at minimizing communication. And once you are sure you, you, you are doing the minimum you could, then you can go down in the stack and then optimize the data movement path. Thank you. Anima? Yeah, I agree with everything uh, that has been said here. Uh, you know, heterogeneity, not just hardware, but applications, right? And, you know, I come back to edge AI as, uh, you know, one where we'll be forced to deal with, right? And indeed, right now, supercomputing versus the edge, uh, you know, is seen as completely different realms, but one day we will think of unifying and having common, uh, of course, software abstractions and frameworks, uh, but also easily, right, things in between how to use AI for efficiency and hardware software co-design. I think that's the future. Thank you. Just one final word, I'm sorry. That's um, okay. Yeah, so um, one word is uh, we are hiring as we can, <laughs> as research, <laughs> as research center. Espe um, especially leaders who will really like to, you know, get to the grounds of, of what, you know, there will be customization heterogeneity. So really work with us to realize the next machine after Fugaku. Okay, thanks very much. Peter. Thank you. So um, again, thank you all, uh, all for attending. So uh, this is just a quick reminder about, uh, you can uh, go and uh, uh, put your feedback and evaluate the session of the panel on the hub. We apologize for any technical issue. So hopefully that will be resolved uh, very soon. And again, last but not least, please thank with me the audience here on site and uh, remotely all our panelists. So thank you, Anima. Thank you, Robert, Laura. Satoshi, James, and Puyo. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. I enjoyed the conference. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.